Hello, I hope this uh, finds everyone well this week. I wanted to give folks a chance to respond via video, or I guess give a response via video, uh, on chapter five. So chapter five has to do with adolescence involved with juvenile justice. And so what gives me a special perspective on this comes from my experience working at Youth and Family Services as the Juvenile Drug Court Coordinator, and also prior to that as the First Time Offender Coordinator. And so with those two jobs, the adolescents that were referred to me to counsel were referred directly from the juvenile justice system. And so to begin our conversation, at least for here in Enid, there were two different routes that uh, an adolescent could land in counseling via juvenile justice. And so the first route would be if the juvenile received a city violation. And so a city violation would be something like I stole some earrings from Claire's Boutique or I tried to take something from Walmart or Kmart and I got caught. So there were a lot of adolescents that were referred on petty larceny charges. There could also be a fight at school. So let's say an adolescent received a battery charge. Or there are also substance related violations too. So how old do you have to be to possess tobacco in Oklahoma? So you have to be at least 18. So you could have a minor in possession of tobacco. You could also have a minor in possession of alcohol or paraphernalia. You could also have some other charges, but those were among the most common. And so what I would do would be to, this was, this was kind of a neat setup for the city of Enid in that we would, they partnership, they had a partnership with Youth and Family Services to meet with families, adolescents. So after they receive a city violation, and it's, say it's one of these, and there may be a couple of others on there too. I, I'm not producing an exhaustive list, but they would go and they would meet with with me to try to find a way to, to provide a diversionary sentencing. So diversionary sentencing would be something that would provide a family, an adolescent and their family support. So many times uh, they would go to the first time offender program. That was a 12 hour mandated education class. And it was mandated for both parents and the adolescents that was first time offender they could also go to let's say they had a battery charge they could also get referred to an anger management class uh, they could also be just referred to counseling let's say that i meet with the family before they go into court 
we find out that there's been a divorce, there's a lot of fighting in the family, uh, or that somebody uh, recently passed away and they're, you know, the adolescent ex is experiencing a lot of different emotional difficulties. And so that gives the chance to intervene in a different way. Rather than just punish the adolescent, it gives the opportunity to divert into something that could be more supportive of the adolescent and their family. They could also, let's say they're one of these, they could also possibly need a substance use assessment. or substance use counseling. So again, something that may be more supportive and conducive to creating a new environment or a new pattern of behavior for the adolescent rather than just punishment. So that's those are city violations. So that was that was one way that they could go. The uh, the second way that they could go would be to uh, be involved with the uh, Oklahoma Juvenile Affairs Office, or OJA. And so it talks about, uh, you know, juvenile justice involved. Uh, OJA is basically folks that are involved with county violations, and so this is then a state level intervention. This would just be, say, over here, a, a city level violation or intervention. And so these things would be possibly more serious. Uh, so, you know, if, we, if we're talking about possession, you know, possibly possession of uh, drugs, uh, maybe burglary, possibly repeated batter, battery, assault and battery, or assault with a dangerous weapon, um, you, know, you could probably put public intox in either one of these categories, I forgot about that, but that one could actually, public intox could also be over there. It also is for, uh, let's say you have somebody that's a repeat offender. So eventually, the city is going to be tired of dealing with the same adolescents over and over. And so let's say, well, and, and the city is going to have to deal with things like, like truancy, or curfew. Those are, those are more city charges. or maybe more significant larceny charges. So really OJA, the juvenile justice system, begins to be involved with more, more significant crimes. And so at this point then, typically uh, we see more, more counseling interventions. I mean, they could still be sentenced hypothetically to, you know, class, you know, anger management, uh, first time offender, but you know, somebody that's on their third assault charge is probably not going to get much from a first offender class. They've kind of graduated on to something more. So, you know, mandated counseling, a lot of family counseling over here, that's mandated. Possibly more mentoring. They could actually be placed in a, in a shelter. Let's say their uh, situation is not safe at home with their parents. So, that's kind of the juvenile justice system, the way it works here around Enid. Now, it may work a little differently, but uh, all counties are under the scope of OJA, and so we've seen a lot of cuts to state budgets, so I know that's one of the agencies that keeps taking cuts, and it's difficult to provide, uh, some of that budget provides for counseling, provides for supervision. Um, one of the good things, uh, that I think you'll notice. Let's go to the text now, so please follow along with the text. So, um, before I go to the one of the good things, go to page 118, if you would, please. Uh, so, page 118. So, page 118 lists several different treatment environments. 
And so I was involved in every one of these treatment environments. Uh, so you can have a home-based. If you think about a home-based environment, what's cool about that is you actually get to see the adolescent and their family in their natural environment. And so you might think, well, they're not going to act natural. Well, it's, it's a lot more likely that they're going to act in their normal way on their home turf than they are if they come to the office. So a lot of times you see what real life looks like, you know, the, the poor attitudes, the shouting back and forth, um, different things like that. The, the actual living environment, which may be really messy, which, you know, may include, uh, you know, a lot of clutter, a lot of bugs, a lot of different things that way. So um, it's, it's pretty, if, for those of, the, the, those of you that are faint of heart, uh, it's not necessarily for those of you that like a nice sterile office environment. Um, although I will say that it, it can get uh, out, of, out of control. Um, I've had a couple people over the years that I've supervised that felt very unsafe in those situations because they didn't go back. But uh, it can also put you in a vulnerable situation where you might have to, you know, report people to child welfare uh, if you see, you know, drugs or you see, um, you know, people being uh, neglected or abused. You have to absolutely have to call that in. So that puts you in a difficult situation where you could be blamed for child welfare being involved or children being removed from their family's care. So that's, it's a, it's a whole different level of boundaries. It, it is easier to um, have boundary difficulties if you're in somebody's home. You know, say you get invited to dinner, sit down and have some, have some chicken with us. So I've had that happen and you just kind of have to say no. Uh, you know, it may be, uh, you don't want to come off as rude, but it's just not that's not something as counselors that we can do. Another place is outpatient. Outpatient is basically counseling, you know, at the, at the office. Residential. So uh, Oklahoma has been closing their residential uh, facilities for adolescents for the past several years. Uh, there aren't very many. Uh, there used to be one in Norman. I think there may be still some semblance of that. But uh, they're also a lockdown detention. Uh, Oklahoma also has been closing those, uh, closing down Raider a few years ago. So there aren't, you aren't going to have, now we do have the Garfield County Detention Center, so there are, there are detention centers around. I've done counseling there. Now, if you think about, okay, what would be difficult about doing counseling in a detention center? Well, it's not necessarily that private here, and you have like a, a glass bowl that you go into and people can see in who you're meeting with. How much reality are you going to get? I mean, an adolescent is completely out of their environment. They're at the mercy of those around them. They're, you know, they're, they're living in a cell. And so, you know, they're basically going to tell you what you want to hear. Uh, you know, a lot of foxhole prayers at that, at that moment. Um, so each, each one of those environments has its own trade-offs. And so please look through table 5-1. Table 5.1 on page 118 there. So let's stay with the text. If you would go with me to page 111. 111 has ta uh, figure 5.1. And what do you notice if you turn to page 111? What do you notice about that figure? If you'll notice, in Oklahoma is following this trend, if you'll notice, juvenile crimes are down considerably, very significantly. So you saw a, a peak of juvenile crime in 1996. And then you see it decreasing rather significantly since 2007. It's really fallen quite a bit. It had a, it had a big drop between 96 and 2000. But then also from 2007 uh, to 2011, there was another big drop. And Oklahoma is following suit and, and seeing fewer, a few arrests. So that's good news. It appears that for all that we say society is going to pot and the hogs are eating it, uh, we're actually seeing fewer crimes. 
It's not to say they're not existent, though. It's not to say that we don't need to keep funding efforts to, to change. So one might say that our efforts are juvenile justice efforts. OJA was created in the 90s, the Juvenile Office of Affairs, and uh, during that height of juvenile crime. And so you, one might say that interventions are working. Uh, regardless of what our television may say, that we're falling off the precipice of death. Um, so we have seen it. We have seen a, a decline. So please read through the demographics. Demographics are, you know, more males and females are involved with the juvenile justice system by far. Seven out of ten offenders are males. You also see uh, a disproportionate uh, number of minorities that uh, are arrested. So I'd like to talk about. Um, this goes back to page 105 on the second paragraph on page 105 who is the client this is difficult and this is important so I'm going to stop this and create another video